Okay, awesome. I had trouble starting the recording there. Hello, everybody. This is my mother. Hello, everybody. This is my son. <laughs> I've been wanting to do a video with her for a while because you are amazing, and I want to share that with people. Well, that's interesting because I wanted to do a video with you because you are amazing. Oh. And I'm just trying to think of, all right, okay, how can we work out this outline where, where it will really work? Yeah, my, my... So now you have a topic. <laughs> um, so... No, I, I thought the topic could be old fogies and young fogies. But... Yeah, she, my mom's wanted for a while to do some kind of content together um, where we use the dynamic of how people use technology in their lives and specifically when that comes to new people using technology versus older individuals using technology. Um, and that's exactly right. But Jack has a different idea for this for this <laughs> event. So we will follow through with Jack's idea. Yeah, so today we're actually going to be talking about, well, at least for me, probably the biggest event in my life. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But um, so as you guys know from the title of this video, uh, we're going to talk to you about how uh, losing a loved one to cancer affected us. Um, I don't really know how we should start. That going about this? I don't know how we should start either because, well, for us, for us, it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, like 12 years? Yes. It's a long about, time. It's actually been almost 13 years, which is interesting because um, when your father Trevi died or passed away or passed, I'm never quite sure what's the more respectful term to use, you were only 12. Um, so it's it's interesting. It's 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 a long long time ago for you, in terms of years, but short in terms of memory. Yeah, yeah, I definitely feel like yeah. that was half my life ago, but it feels like that that's when my life started. <laughs> well, well, what about if we start with talking about who he was for you, mm -hmm. and what kind of things either you remember or um, what kind of impact as the years have gone by I've often heard that that when a, a parent dies mm -hmm. um, and you're you're young that oftentimes because you're young it, it holds a, a, a particular spot in your in your mind so to speak and you don't actually really try and 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 develop it or think about it or mm -hmm. process it until you're much older. Yeah. And and I think that's a really interesting concept to to try and, and, and look at as well. So you're asking like what my father is to like what that means to me? Yes, or? for 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 example, we you know, talking about who Trevi was um, what you remember when you were 12 in terms 13, 14, 15 in terms of your, um, your thoughts about your dad versus okay. where you are now. What, what is different? Is it just because you're older now and you want to try and, and put some order into your youth? Mm -hmm. uh, is it another, you want to try and remember more? What what is it? It's hard to tell because I didn't. I mean, he died. I was I was twelve. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't think a twelve year old's capable of really knowing somebody, mm -hmm. um, let alone your own father. Like, there's so many. We tend to idolize our our parents. You know, it's definitely we tend to idolize or hate our parents as as children, um, and I think that's one of the things that was hard for me is that I I don't feel like I got to know my father mm -hmm. before he died. Mm -hmm. I just had the childish perceptions of what a father is. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know my father as a person. Yes. Um, and so I've had a lot of thoughts, obviously, but the thoughts are more about like, okay, he also lost his father. Um, so I know that we're, we face similar forces. Um, but I'd say the most obvious thing really is that this YouTube channel really one, one of the reasons I'm so dedicated to it is because if my dad had had a YouTube channel um, <laughs> before 
he died, then I could get to know him and I yeah. could understand myself better, so even though he was dead. Yes. Um, so for me, if I have a kid and I die, they can still get to know me. And that mm -hmm. is one way that I try and find strength through the event, mm -hmm. because ultimately I can't really, I can learn who my father was through conversations with you and people who knew him. But ultimately, like, by the time he died, I didn't know him yet. And that's the problem. That's a, that's a really good point. And, and I think that, that you're absolutely spot on in terms of um, when you're, you now will learn about him when you talk to his family, when you talk to us. And we all have a different slice of Trevi that we can share mm -hmm. with you. I also think that had he been able to do a recording, and I, I know he would have done that, and he would have said, let's talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, that's the kind, he would, have, he would have done that because he was all about uh, a showman kind of thing. But he had a lot in his head. And oftentimes, even if he was going to do a, a video like this, he would have, um, it would have been a slice of him mm -hmm. that you saw. Just like you're getting different slices of him, whether you talk about, whether you, you, you learn something from Hazel, his sister, about it, or Mickey's good friends, um, or me, or, or Dermot, uh, you're getting all these slices. And maybe, you know, maybe that's all we ever get. Because <laughs> when you think about the family that you're with, the, the people that you love, that you're still with, mm -hmm. you still only see slices. You still only yeah, see slices. True. The difference is that you can, you can reach back out to them and, and, and say, hey, why'd you do that? Mm -hmm. Or what do you mean by that? Or, hey, I just want to just wanna be with you for a while. And that's what you don't have. It's that physical presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it, true. That was, that was so critical. That was very critical. So, what what would you say, what did you like about Dad? Because, I mean, you, you met him, foreign country, and then you guys got involved, so you obviously yeah. liked him, but what, what, drew you, what drew you to him? I think it was, well, well, part of it was just his wackiness. I mean, you know, when I, when I met him, first of all, he was my boss. He was teaching French, and I was teaching Spanish in this school in Sri Lanka. And he was also very much interested in theater, mm -hmm. really good at theater. Um, and uh, when, when I met him, he was, if you, if you can imagine, he used to wear these, like, really, really short shorts. Super oh, yeah, short, I remember short, you short. telling me this. But his, like, private parts would sometimes hang out. <laughs> and he would sort of pretend like he didn't notice that was going on. And, in fact, I remember the first time I saw him. I was coming from the airport because my, my flight had been a little bit delayed. And we were going to... It was in August of uh, in, in Sri Lanka, so it was kind of hot. And I was coming in some kind of rickshaw or whatever. And then there was this man who came across... Our, our vision, if you will, with these short, short shorts on, and, and something was wrong with his glasses. I, they were kind of <laughs> cockeyed, but he was on this little dinky Yamaha motorcycle. <laughs> and he kept hitting. It seemed like every single rut, he would hit. <laughs> and then his glasses would go a little bit more cockeyed. And the funny thing was that later we learned that he had been um, participating in a play, uh -huh. and somehow he was one person and he was supposed to play a crowd. <laughs> and so he played a crowd of one. And in his exuberance in playing the crowd of one, he fell off the stage. And then that's how his glasses got uh, all got, cockeyed, because yeah. one, one of the arms broke off. And so he kind of liked that cockiness of, of these <laughs> glasses. So he wore them for quite a, quite a good period of time until he finally got them fixed. But then he, he won an award for his... <laughs> his, his performance his at performance the play. His <laughs> performance play as a, as a crowd of one. And, and I think he just had... Um, he, he well, Regardless of whether he was in a play, he, he played life like a play. Mm -hmm. And he had such talents, particularly with um, words. 
he could uh, he could just make words sing and what he didn't have and what you have is confidence he didn't have a lot of self-confidence in terms of uh, he had a lot of potential mm -hmm. but sometimes when you have people with potential they're their own worst enemies in yeah, the sense I think that, for most of us. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And and then he would have moments where he would direct a play, something along that line, mm -hmm. and he'd be on top of the world. Um, because he'd be in control. Mm -hmm. He would be in control of all the actors, everything. He would he would funnel his vision of what it should be in that play mm -hmm. to all the other actors. And if if one or two of them didn't see his way, he would keep funneling them ah, 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 until they did. Um, and, and, and it was just his, uh, his passion for living, really. Mm -hmm. I think that was quite interesting. Hmm. Well, what do you remember about him? What do I remember yeah. about him? Um, it's, it's so hard for me to articulate that because I, I don't really know... There are things that I, I think about him, like I think of him as a very kind of like, not necessarily opinionated, but outspoken, but I don't know if that's true. Well, I think you can pretty much say both of those. Oh, both of those things. Okay, so opinionated <laughs> and, then, and outspoken. Dermot would often say, he doesn't suffer a fool gladly. <laughs> So he would tend to tell you what he thought of you um, and uh, and not think anything about it. It wasn't really a judgment. You know, if he thought you were an idiot, he'd probably say you were an idiot. And, uh, of course, he wasn't always politically correct as a teacher. He'd always, <laughs> not always, I shouldn't say always, but there'd be times where, let's say there was a... a, 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 a Class change of mm -hmm. some sort, right? And he push push the kids out of the way. Human being coming through, <laughs> get out of the way. Human being coming through, and then mosey on down the steps. Uh, but the kids, you know, the kids seem to recognize that ah, this is Mr. Pittman. You know, it wasn't. They so he was knew a character. He was a character. He was an absolutely a character. Uh, at one point, he had a bad back. Well, he had a bad back a lot of times particularly when we were going to move. Uh, <laughs> Dee, me back, me back, me back. And so there was one extended period of time where he, he had, uh, he was suffering like a lot. Plank, of, right? I remember uh, we put him on a plank oh, at some point. Oh, God, yeah. yes, we did everything. And, and he didn't, he, he, he wasn't a very quiet person, um, particularly if he was not feeling well. It seems everybody knew he was then not feeling well. But... At one point in time, he, his back was really bothering him, and uh, he still had to teach. Mm -hmm. So he did it in Trevor fashion. He had them bring his easy chair into the classroom, this kind of chair that he could just sit like a king <laughs> in. And he had this cane of some sort that he would just go, You! Yo! Whoa, what is the declarative of blah, 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 no, no, not good, you, what is it, what is it, and he would just rain, he would just rain in his classroom, um, and, uh, but as I say, even though it seemed like he had a lot of confidence, self-confidence, there was always that bit of doubt, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, he was working on that book for such a long time, yeah, yeah, and, uh, I once asked a good friend of his, do you think he'll ever finish? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, he won't finish. He won't finish because either it's, it's too much of a perfectionist mm -hmm. in the sense that he just wanted to get it so perfect mm -hmm. and he was afraid he might not. But he would never tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Mm, he would never tell you that. But you, you wanted to talk about how, how do you handle the after years? Yeah, this is because really the point here is that some some of you listening to this either are going through loss of a loved one or know someone who has or is about to. Mm -hmm. um, so what I want to establish is what, if anything, anybody could have done for either of us mm -hmm. um, in order to make it 
easier because obviously you you cannot take something like that away. It is a your life. It's a when, part of you. It, yeah, it, it the death becomes a part of you. That doesn't mean that it will make mm -hmm. your life worse. Mm -hmm. If you play your cards right, it will improve your life. You will be much more appreciative of things. But you do have to make that be what happens. If you view this tragedy as something that ruins your life, then it will. You have to do everything that you can to maintain a positivity and think about the person and the fact that they want you to be happy. And really, that is really, really, really important. But can you think of anything that, from your case, because I lost my father and my mother lost her husband, um, which is, is very different experiences, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but I, I, what, what could your friends and family well, I, I, let me take it in small steps. I think that um, one of the areas that we have trouble with as, as a culture, in the U.S. at least, is we don't talk about dying. We don't talk about death. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, it's just the natural cycle of things. It's absolutely inevitable. <laughs> it is inevitable. I mean, every breath, you're just closer to that. You know, some of the way we go, who knows what's going to happen, and I'm not clear in my head whether it's better if you have an illness or if it's better if you go suddenly, unfortunate, in some kind of an accident. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what, there's a loss and there's a cutoff. You ask what kinds of things people can do. I'm not so sure I have suggestions for what people can do. I think in general we we need to be more open about death mm -hmm. and grief and what it means. And we need to accept that it is a bad time. And I think that at least my a generation, hard time, a sure. hard time, my generation was kind of brought up, at least at least I, I think in, in my head this idea was out there that well, if you try hard enough, nothing bad will really happen to you. And if something bad happens to you, then you didn't try hard enough. <laughs> and and I think that that takes away from the the beauty of life. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely, absolutely, when Trevi was very sick, all I wanted to do was just be right there. Just be right there. I didn't care if he said anything, didn't care. I just, it was that presence. I, mm -hmm. I've often talked about P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E. The <laughs> presence is important because that is something that you will take with you after he goes. Mm -hmm. You, as a child, didn't have that. Um, and I think you were often trying just to kind of, uh, of, kind of stay out of the way but still recognize what was going on. So you retreated into your games and into yeah, that books kind of thing, and games. books and things, kind of not knowing how. And, and I was, I mean, quite frankly, I was ignorant. Um, you know, I should have taken the time to talk more with you about it. But I, I didn't know. I did the same thing. I withdrew after mm -hmm. he was gone. And I think you and I both didn't realize how much we had withdrawn. Yeah. Um, we got along with our day-to-day -day lives. That was fine. But I distinctly remember a conversation with you where I said, you know, I really don't care if I live. I really don't. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, here I was supposed to be the adult. <laughs> and I'm not helping you at all. And I've often thought about that day, wishing I could sort of relive it, and a number of other days as well. So you ask what we think, what we should. I think as a culture, we should be much more open about the fullness, the cycle of life, and talk about the death, um, because there is some, if you will, there's an odd kind of beauty in death. Oftentimes, yeah. it can happen as you're getting older, and you've been able to watch younger people come up. I think that's a great thing. I think that if you don't. Um, talk about death then you will not understand the feelings that you will experience afterwards everybody mm -hmm. experiences them differently um, you can be 
you can think that you're okay, and then all of a sudden you realize that you've just become a ritual person. Mm -hmm. You're okay because you're performing rituals. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I tried to do with you, at, at least it was one of the little right things maybe, was that I always tried to tell you about Trevor and mm -hmm. talk about him with his name, with incidents, um, because I knew you were going to remember him as Sick. having been ill. Yeah. 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 And doing odd things, yeah. um, like cooking the sausages at you know six in the morning, and uh, then forgetting about them for ten hours. And the house was a little bit smoky yeah. when he come back. Trevi, what have I don't know. I I can't see very well. Well, Trevi, there's a lot of smoke in this house. <laughs> um, but you know there were so many little stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so many little stories. I come back to, I think, one thing you could do as a friend is not sort of, not kind of, dem I, I, demean is going to come out as a harsh word. Mm -hmm. I don't mean demean, but I can't think of the right word to use at the moment. And that is when that somebody is, is really in grief, that they will look different, they will act different, they will respond different. Um, Try not to empathize if if you can't empathize. <laughs> you yeah. know? If, if, hey, I'm sorry your dad's dead. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> so sorry to hear that. Well, <laughs> I don't know what you can say in, in, in lieu of that. I, I, re I really don't. Um, but sometimes it comes across, and, and you know that it's out of a desperation of, well, I don't want to offend, I want to say the right thing. Um, but sometimes it can come across as, no, you don't have a clue what it's like. Mm -hmm. um, it's also made me, I, I think that another area is that you start to become much more conscious of the horrible experiences that people are going through in different countries mm -hmm. where there is a lot of death. For whatever yeah. reason. Whereas what we went through is a daily occurrence. It's, it, it, what we went through is a daily occurrence and um, we are lucky that Trevi was here for us. Uh, my sister one once said, well, any day that has a day in Trevi with it, with it, any day with Trevi it is a good day. <laughs> Um, however, we went through a normal cycle, mm -hmm. and any mistakes we made about um, not being as open to each other and not being as open to others as we could have was our own doing. doing. Yeah, yeah. When we think about other, some other cultures, um, some other ethnic groups who face this day in, day out, day in, day out, they're the ones that I wonder. How do they do that? How do they get that resilience yeah. to to just um, uh, put it into a compartmentalization, a, a compartment in their heads, bring it out when they need it, get on with their lives? How do they do that? That's that's an amazing skill, I think. Well, maybe through more of an appreciation of death than they have in the states. <laughs> yes, it, but as you talked about, in our case, we knew we knew Trevi was ill. Um, we knew we had a period of time with him, but there are other cases where because of accidents, because of violence, whatever, the person that you maybe shared toast with in the morning is not there anymore. Yeah. Just gone. Um, so I don't know about you. I had, I went into therapy, a kind of therapy. It was a therapy in Spanish, actually. Oh, really? So it was kind of interesting. <laughs> But that was about four or five years after Trevor's death because I realized that I needed to change some things. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I was undergoing cancer myself. Yeah. Um, and so it was kind of a combination. My big question, one of my questions that I kind of wanted to find out was, well, sometimes you hear about a type of empathy sickness. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if, if a spouse or a loved one dies of a certain disease, let's say heart disease, um, the caretaker mm -hmm. can, yeah, get that can disease. Get it. Yeah, yeah. And you think, what? what is that? That's really interesting. Crazy. So that was one of the questions why I wanted, that I wanted to answer. But, but really, I, I, I'm very 
Mm. I'm very truthful in that I wish, um, I wish I had been um, more open to your needs. Um, because sometimes I was too conscious of my own needs that I forgot about yours. Due that, there was no way for... Nothing could prepare you for what you had to go through. And it wasn't like you had a, a good, supportive network of friends and family around you who mm -hmm. you spent regular time with. We were al not alone in the country, but we weren't around anybody. Like, we were the three major people in our lives. And mm -hmm. I think that, in particular, that newness to the country made it much harder than it would have been had... Like now, I have a support network of friends yeah. that when, when something goes wrong, I, I have multiple people who watch for me and know me, and I can't hide from them if I'm in a bad mood. They, they know. They know me inside and out, and being around that is so, so much better. It just, it's so much better. Yeah. And I think that, for, from my end, what... What I think that you can do, if you're, if you know somebody who's going through um, something like this, is just reach out regularly. That is just spending time, even if it's boring, and even if you feel like the the person's just sad and that you're not helping them by spending time with them and reaching out to them, you are making their life so 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 much easier. Um, and I personally try really hard to reach out to my friends and family um, because of these things that we've been through you don't you could die tomorrow it's if you you're you may think that that's insane but like if you get in an automobile every day you are taking you are making the decision I want to work and I'm gonna risk dying to do this that could pay off against you you know that yeah. we are all quite close to death and what is really important is to live your life in a way that you don't... Regret. Exactly. When, if you die, you don't regret the last thing you said to whoever you love. You don't... This is so true. You don't... You know, it, it's so important to just live every day as if, mm -hmm. you know, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, you just made, you just made a, a couple of really good points. One was um, you asked... You encourage people to to make use of the support group that they have, whether it's church, family, friends, um, work. Mm -hmm. um, and as you were talking, I was thinking about something else you had said. You said, you know, the three of us were like, we were our support group for the most part. We were lucky enough to have family members try and friends come and, mm -hmm. and try and help. But But you're right, for the most part, it was us three. And as I'm thinking about that, a vision of, of kind of a stool comes to mind, you know, three-legged stool. You take away one of the legs, woof, <laughs> can't sit on that it at stool, all. <laughs> oh my God, it, it just can't, you can't sit on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that any time you are lucky enough to have a support group, we, we started talking about the slices of, of a personality or of a person um, that each of us knows about someone that we love. We, we can never know totally one, everything there is to know. Yeah. I mean, you can know um, almost everything right. about somebody if you live with them and spend all day with them, but... but yeah, you, know. you can. You don't know what's going on in their heads, <laughs> yeah. but you can see what, what, what they're choosing but to in, display. In, in general, that doesn't happen. We no. Don't, you know, yeah. However, as you're talking about that support group, I realize, oh, yeah that would be a really great idea because each of those, let's say it's a, a neighbor is part of the support group. Yeah, yeah. They offer a slice of help. Mm -hmm. A family member offers a slice of help. The church offers a slice of help. It's all about, and then it comes together to form a whole picture. Yeah, if you because, have that community. Yeah, you. it's very rare that, that one person can can take care of everybody's one individual one other individual's needs mm -hmm. there have to be uh, there has to be a, a so so the way that this concept might look in real yeah. life would be like say that there's somebody who recently went through something some kind of grief whatever and you wouldn't normally invite them to whatever event you're as whether because they're awkward or you just don't really know them that well um 
it would be really good for them to invite them, even even if you don't feel like you have reason to. Literally, just because somebody they know just died. Yeah. It it's a really good excuse to. Mm -hmm. You're just gonna like you really want them to feel like people are at least trying to reach out to them. At least if, if they're choosing to say no and they're choosing mm -hmm. to just be sad and you can do that for a bit, but you know, they at least need something to say no to. That yes. is really, and, and really important. I think that that comes along, that, that also is part of that idea of we don't actually talk about death and dying very much. Mm -hmm. um, when you are part of a culture where it is an integral part, just like, just like birth is, that you'll find that, you know, we are inviting people over. And understanding that, you know, we are doing our activities. We absolutely want you to be part of it. And if your part of it is sitting over there on the side, that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, it's, it's only a very special person who's going to be able to know that, hey, come on. Get off that chair and come do something. Yeah. Um, certain people can do that with a plum. Other people can do it and it falls flat. <laughs> um, but but I think that 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 is very true. Um, any kind of support group that that you can have um, will help you in the various parts of your mind and your personality to mm -hmm. get through. Definitely. Awesome. I think that. I know that's quite a serious topic, um, but... Yeah, next time we're going to do old fogey, young fogey. <laughs> yeah, we will be doing... He's going to be the old fogey. <laughs> <laughs> we will be doing more videos. Um, but I guess that's, that's about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, can I just finish off? Because mm -hmm. it's not just... I think, um, you know, we, we talk about our culture right now is, is having some issues with... Um, oh, trying to be open-minded with uh, different ethnic groups, different um, genders, all kinds of different ideas. I mean, I'm all about inclusivity. I think that's really important. Um, and when we talk about um, uh, this kind of, of event, I think that in the talking about it, we are all being inclusive. Mm -hmm. and, and that is so important. Well, to be honest, that's not the point I wanted to say. I, <laughs> but it sounded good. I, I just completely <laughs> forgot. I, I'm sure it was really important, and it was going to just kind of sum everything all up together. Um, but, oh, oh, I remember what it was. You know, these different, for instance, yellow school buses. I think of our, our, our culture sometimes as a yellow school bus culture, and what I mean by that is we segregate. Yeah. We segregate in so many ways. Um, one way is by... Um, uh, uh, money one way is by neighborhood I mean there, there's just multitudes of ways um, but when we talk about um, uh, death and we want to open up the communication I think this idea about talking from generation to generation is is really important um, we started off kind of laughing about the old fogey young fogey but it's really that I believe that each of the generations can learn from the other. Um, we're always going to have arguments about it, always. And and so one of the things I'm, I'm most <coughs> appreciative with Jack in, in, in this particular subject, it's, it's, it's a time to try and say, okay, Jack, well, what do you think about this? Well, here's what I think. But, and nobody says anything grand, but it's just a little bit easier to... Um, to maintain open communication mm -hmm. and to even when our brains are thinking about it in the subconscious when we're sleeping or just driving or whatever we're doing um, your brain starts to put together different ideas um, and it's all good it's all good all right guys thank you so much for watching if you are going through something or you know somebody who is please send me an email at jackdermotpittman at gmail.com and I will offer any kind of support I can to let you know that you're not the only one going through that. Any advice you want, you can ask me anything, okay? And again, that's J-A-C-K-D-E-R-M-O-T-P-I-T-M-A-N at gmail.com. Okay? Thank you.
Bye, guys. Bye, guys. I've never said that before, but bye, guys. <laughs>